and die. The dogma gives the church too much freedom when it gives it the authority that what it binds on earth shall be bound in heaven and what it looses on earth shall be loosed in heaven. It's not the doctrines that limit us. It's the denial of them. It's only the truth that makes us free. Spend more time with the Apostle of Common Sense. Visit Chesterton.org for more information and go to EWTNRC.com to discover more books and programs written and inspired by G.K. Chesterton. in Birmingham, is our church. This whole network is built on trust. The essence of evangelization is to tell everybody Jesus loves you. We are all called to be great saints. Don't miss the opportunity. Well, I don't know about you, but we've been having a plague of ladybugs. Here's one right here. And uh, she or he is going to listen. <laughs> so, it, and it's a beautiful thing. Well, <clears throat> a few weeks ago, we began a program on mortification. And to my surprise, everybody liked it. I thought, ah, they're going to turn that down for sure. But they didn't. So we said there were three kinds of mortification. And I'm sure there are many more. But mainly, they all follow into one of these categories. The first was the mortification that comes from inside yourself. You're angry. Uh, you're impatient. Uh, you're greedy. Uh, just a thousand things that we are, that we're born with, selfishness, jealousy, ambition. And, and we struggle with those things. We struggle, struggle all our lifetime. We have to make choices between what we are, what Jesus is, and what we want to be. We want to be like him. That's the first mortification. The second mortification we took last Tuesday was the mortification that comes from the world. Different than in my grandmother's day. Divorce was hardly a, in fact, I was the only uh, child of divorce presence in the whole school. Uh, drugs, uh, all of the things that we have today, if they were there, they weren't as much or as known as they are today. It wasn't the focus of evil. There was poverty, and, and the wages were low, and there was every kind of thing that, that you could kind of put your hand on. And if immigrants came to America, they had to build their churches, they had to build their schools. And so everything was hard, everything was difficult. If you travel 20 miles, it was like going to Europe. So in those days, the world was very different than it is today. Today, or to this evening, we're going to talk about the third tempter, temptation we all have, and that is the enemy. Not your enemy. 
uh, the enemy, Satan, Lucifer, call him what you want. I want to read to you from St. Matthew's Gospel. I think it's the fifth, fourth, fourth chapter. How the enemy works in your life and how he even tempted the Son of God. And I want you to understand that everybody has all three of these temptations. Self, the world, the enemy. Now, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. Ah, what do you know about that, huh? He just didn't go in the wilderness and the, and the enemy said, ah, here's this great prophet. I think I'll go for it. No. He was sent by the Spirit to be tempted. Ah, that's something. By who? The devil. You know, a lot of people today say there is no devil, there is no hell. Oh, do I have a surprise for you? <laughs> if you're not careful, you'll be living with him forever. The worst temptation today is to say there is no devil, there are no demons, there is no tempter. Why? Well, because that leaves you wide open. He wants you not to believe in him. If you don't believe in him, then you're going to be feel pretty free to do anything bad or evil that you want to. Now let's go on, and then we're going to compare how the enemy treats us the same way. Okay. So our dear Lord fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and he was hungry. Can you imagine God being hungry? <laughs> I wouldn't want to be hungry if I was, didn't have to be hungry. But Jesus loved you and I so much, he wanted to feel hunger. Mm. So the tempter comes. And he says, if you are the Son of God, he didn't know, you see. Tell these stones to turn into loaves. And what did our Lord say? He said, man does not live by bread alone. But I, every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now, what does that mean? How many people have told you, is there Jesus? Is there a Son of God? How do you know He lived? How do you know He resurrected? What do you mean, original sin? Oh, come on. Do you believe in original sin? So they say to you that all of these things you have learned and believe in with all your heart that direct your life, your mind, your ideals, your goals, is nothing. See? And it's a temptation not to believe the Word of God. Now the enemy tempted our dear Lord to sensuality. He said, look, if you're a guide, you, you can make these stones bread. Why not? You're hungry. We, run, we are tempted today to run after every kind of satisfaction. Every kind. I don't think we have had in history at least not as much as we do those who starve themselves because they, they have a phobia about gaining weight. or those who eat all they want and then put their finger down their throat and then let it out and then go and eat again. Yeah, the, the Romans did that. Isn't it strange that it's all coming back? See, it said desire for pleasure, for more than you need. To be precise, he wanted our Lord to perform some miracle for himself. 
He wanted our Lord to be selfish at that moment. Our Lord, wouldn't do it. our Lord never performed a miracle for himself, always for someone else to prove that he was Son of God. It was always to manifest his love for mankind, that he was sent by the Father. I only do what I see the Father do. I only say what I hear the Father say. So Jesus said, look, a lot of these things that we want, that we need, or we think we need, are not necessary. Do we live by every word in this book? Now, what does the tempter do to you and me? Well, he brings up theologians and great men of great intellects. And they say, oh, there's no such thing as a human being. We're just material objects. Really? I don't know. Looks like flesh and bone to me. But because you're nothing but material object, all of you, you can do what you want, when you want, how you want, as you want, because when you die, you go back to Mother Earth. I can guarantee you're going back to Mother Earth. But not for long. Because when you deny the resurrection, then none of us will be raised. And St. Paul says, if you are, if, if he didn't raise, rise, raise himself from the dead, then your faith is useless. So you see, the tempter in the past tempted nations to greed, and so they went to war. It tempted many people to uh, take advantage of their neighbor, get as high up and as wealthy as they could, no matter who they walked on. The, the tempter has tempted man from day one, from Adam and Eve. But the temptation today is different. Why? The temptations today all tend to go in the same direction. And what is that direction? I will not serve. You know, I just saw a tape of, uh, and, and you've all been asking, that's my question for the week. I got phone calls and phone calls and phone calls on a 60-minute program that had an, a group called a Call to Action, We Are the Church. So our, fa our, our family is very angry over this. I'll give you a short opinion. It is mine, <laughs> my opinion. <laughs> it, it manifested to me the greatest temptation in the world today. It was so clear. It manifested rebellion and the whole reality of the, the very essence of Satan, I will not serve. It was an amazing 12 minutes. Because I thought 60 Minutes did a wonderful job because what they did is they would come off with this rebellion and and, and, and one, one person there said something like, uh, we are not going to ever say uh, the hand made of the Lord, done in, very, in a very mockery kind of way. My dear sister, you shall one day say handmaid of the Lord, and you shall know Mary is the mother of God, and you shall bend the knee before the name of Jesus, as even Satan does. There was this rebellion that is so different. Why? Because it's throughout the world. I will not serve. And so, like Jesus, you, you, you are tempted to presume, to be presumptuous, 
to accept other gods. Other gods. To do your own thing. There was some kind of a, a service done at the time on this program. It, it showed uh, somebody breaking bread and, and, and serving wine, and that was their mess. If you dislike the Mass so much and you don't believe in the body and blood of Christ, why do you mock it? See, that doesn't make anything. There's that rebellion. Rebellion against God and against His Church. One of them said, well, the Holy Father, we, we respect Him, but uh, He has a right to His opinion. Ah, the enemy. The enemy. It is not an opinion he has. He is vicar of Christ, and he gives you the truth from God himself. Over 2,000 centuries, we have arrived at these truths and doctrines and dogma and morals. Morals. This is not an opinion. See, if we're all going to live by opinions, <laughs> We're going to live very miserable lives. Why? Because everybody's opinion is different. If I were to ask everybody right here what I just said, they all be different. Because everybody's going to hear something different. They're going to hear what they need to hear. And they'll give an opinion. Truth is not an opinion. Truth is truth. And it stands alone. You know, there's a, a little passage here. It says, Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, when the rebel comes, whoa, is he here? Satan will set to work. There will be all kinds of miracles and deceptive show of signs and everything evil that can deceive those who are bound for destruction because they will not grasp the love of truth which could have saved them. See? So that's the first way you're tempted. The second way, the devil took our Lord up to the holy uh, city and made him stand on the very top of the temple. And he said, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for scripture says he will put your he will put you in this angel's charge and they will support you. Presumption again, you see. Many of you that commit many sins, fornication, just about everything you can think of. You're told that you that it's okay. You're just human. That's news. Uh, that you can't help it. That's also news, because you can. Uh, that you're born that way. Nobody questions that. See, I was born impatient. My mother said I yelled and screamed, and I looked like I was five months old. <laughs> I was fat. Haven't changed any. <laughs> uh, had a head of hair that you wouldn't believe. And uh, uh, my hands are just gone, ready. Ready to go. And they thought it was funny. But you see, we know that from that, that tall, a, a child is selfish or angry, hot-tempered. But they're telling you that you can presume on God, that you can sin. He understands. He's compassionate. But you see, you can't do that. You wouldn't think of hitting your father or mother or somebody you loved because they will understand. They're not going to understand. You cannot say that if God says, thou shalt not. Ah, that's what you don't want to hear. Thou shalt not. But who is it that doesn't want to hear thou shalt not? Satan. Eh? 
When Michael said to him, who is like God? Who? You are not like God. We want to be like God. Ah, now here's the third temptation, and you're going to find out how many of us want to be like God. Taking him to a very high mountain now, the devil showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. He said, I will give you all of these if you fall at my feet and worship me. Where have you heard that? Huh? Somebody told me there was a large uh, statue of the goddess Sophia somewhere in the west. The goddess Sophia. Is she the goddess of fertility? Anybody know? Seems like you don't need to know anything else about fertility. What, what is this goddess business, huh? What? Why? Why do you teach little children in catechism about a goddess? There is no God other than the one true God. There are no goddesses. God, can you imagine worshiping some <laughs> goddess? <laughs> I mean, this great, big, ugly-looking goddess, if you will, <laughs> kneel down to and incense to someone that you put there. Or, wow. Or getting yourself in a kind of state of hypnotic prayer where you have a mentor from God knows where to teach you, oh, why do you do things like that? The enemy. Because what does he say here? Worship me, and I will give you the world. And Jesus said, you will worship the Lord your God and serve him alone. Him alone. You see, in open rebellion against the church, against her truth, against her faith and her morals, you make yourself a god. And you call God a liar. I say to thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not overcome it. Today, the Satan works in a much different way, but so powerful. He uses compassion to, tr to convince you that you really can't correct anyone because you're grass judging them. Oh, <laughs> really? They even say that if the church is rash judging, in this uh, program on 60 Minutes, one of the women there, I don't know if she was a sister or not, but one of the women, she had to be one or the other, so I'll call her a woman, um, said, uh, the Holy Father hates everybody. My mouth opened, you know. And she said, he hates uh, homosexuals, he hates lesbians, he hates adulterers, he hates abortionists. She said, gee, there's nobody left. Are you calling the whole world evil or gay or an abortionist? Oh, come on. See, you have to understand, this is Satan. You have to understand that the church is the voice of God that says this is wrong. Why? Because it offends God. Because we are his creatures and he has a right, he has rights over us to say this is right and this is wrong. Now we know the whole world can't be evil. How could our dear Holy Father hate the world? Acts are evil. 
He doesn't hate people. The beautiful thing about that 60-minute show is that they every so often would show uh, 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 parts of, of our Holy Father's trips here, there, and everywhere with thousands of people around him. And there you could see that holy man, prayerful, loving, preaching love to the whole world and every country. No matter how tired he is or how sick he is, and the enemy, you see. Let me tell you something about him. <laughs> Our dear Lord said he was a liar from the beginning. Why you listen to a liar? From the beginning, he was a liar. In fact, he said to the Pharisees, you're like your father, who was a liar from the beginning. Why was he lying? Because he thought he should be God. He forgot he was made, created by God. He forgot his talents came from God. He forgot that he himself was inferior to God as a creature of God. And he says, no, I will ascend to the throne of the Most High. And, and, and Michael said, hey, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> there, who is like God? There is no one like God. You are not like God. So today the temptation is to worship creation. See, Lucifer began to worship himself. That's the whole point. He worships himself. And so there's nobody like him. And there is no law. There is absolutely nothing outside of him. But see, that's how he's tempting people today. If the church judges, and the church must judge, that this particular act is wrong, and if it is done, you can endanger your soul. Now, the devil says today, that's judgment. That's terrible. How can you judge someone? But judgment is based on truth. You see? Grace leaves you. God leaves you. St. Paul says uh, light and darkness have nothing in common. You cannot live a life of sin and go to communion. Well, that's another thing the devil says. Oh, God, understand. Go on. What would he care? In fact, if you receive communion under pain of, and you're in a state of sin, it'll give you courage. For what? Sacrilege never gives you courage. So the enemy today is after you. Television, uh, magazines, everywhere, billboards. I opened up a catalog. I get a lot of catalogs. I don't know where they get my name, but do I get the catalogs? I got every kind of catalog. So I just opened up one of these catalogs. It had a, a nude person advertising power tools. <laughs> Can you imagine passing by and seeing this nude kid sawing a tree? <laughs> I mean, the, you see, now, you got to be kind of sick, you know? I, I, <laughs> <laughs> if nudity is in, they'll put it in any catalog. It doesn't matter. <clears throat> Little babies are nude, running around. See, the enemy.
enemy keeps saying that bad is, is good and good is bad. You don't know anymore, do you? You keep your children in your own house and they're not, they're living with someone in your own house, not married. And what happens? The enemy says, that's compassion. What are they going to do if you throw them out? I can tell you what I tell them to do. <laughs> get your act together and get a job. And get married. Ah, that's another thing of the enemy today. Don't get married. What happens if you don't like it? <laughs> well, <laughs> there's a lot of things we do we don't like. So that gives you a reason for not being married. You live together for years and years and years. Well, even a law after seven years, is that it? You're married. <sighs> oh, it's okay. Let your kids have fun. You know, metal rock or whatever you call it is okay. Watch gone into some kind of big auditorium where men are up there in a frenzy eating bats and <laughs> all kind of crazy lights. You can't even see who's up there. You know, just lights gone everywhere and everybody's in a frenzy. If that's not a sample of hell, I think you're blind. You're blind. Ah, now here's another thing the enemy does to you. Very subtle. You watch him, you know. He's not going to go around with these big... You're, you're so blind now you can't see the big things. You are unaffected by violence by earthquakes, by floods. You're unaffected by sin. You're unaffected by murder. You're unaffected by accidents. We are unaffected by any evil today. What a temptation. Ask yourself tonight, what affects me? I want to retreat Sunday. And I just sat there with the Lord. And I thought to myself, you know, the church had a beginning, a birth. And then it had an adolescence after all the martyrdoms in the, in the year four or five hundred. And then it went through its adulthood. And now, it's beginning its passion. Our Lord now at the church is in his agony in the garden. Because the most subtle of all temptations is when it comes from religious or priests who say, oh, but there is no original sin who teach your children there is no resurrection. His spirit rose. He lives in the mind of people. See, that doesn't look as bad as violence on television. It looks rather innocent. People who teach you that Jesus, oh, the prophet, this revolutionary who did a good job, but now, well, now we have something else. See, that's not a, that's not a war of violence. It's not uh, prostitutes from the age of 12 in New York City walking the streets. No, see, that isn't, doesn't look bad. Inclusive language, well, that doesn't look bad. My goodness, we want to offend these women who feel so bad. 
that God excluded them from the scriptures. The greatest woman ever lived. That God gave more grace than anybody in the world, including all the angels, was a woman. Her name, Mary, Mother of God. Hmm. When you refuse to say father, or you say father, mother, or just mother, or you're afraid to say that he was born a man, What, what do you think about that, huh? Does that sound too bad? Does it sound bad to say he was um, incarnated by the Holy Spirit? That's one thing I just read. And born. Oh, really? <laughs> mm. Now, see that the average person that says it all, oh, no. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. So you see, inclusive language doesn't look too bad. But it sucks out the very name of God. See, it changes doctrine. See, it's a matter of Christology, not of language. It's a matter of holding on to everything in this book, everything in the church. But see, it's been in your books, it's been in your lectionaries for years now, and you don't know it. And so gradually they'll add something else and something else and something else, and you'll be numb, because you haven't even begun to know it from way back. My friends, that's the most dangerous kind of temptation. The most dangerous. Because it's a creepy kind. It's a creepy kind. It's a kind that comes over you over the years. Where compassion gives leave for sin where disobedience gives leave for the desire to follow one's own conscience. Well, people that commit murder follow their own conscience. People that lie and steal, they all follow their own conscience. The devil is alive and well and very strong. The big things you catch on to. <laughs> but these other things, especially when they come from people in high places, are like a thin film that gets thicker and thicker and thicker. And the first thing you know, you're blind. Blind as a bat. You no longer see the truth. And the real truth looks very uncompassionate. If a homosexual is born that way, why bother, it, poor guy? You mean there's no self-control? You mean he can do as he wills, when he wills, and how he wills, and he's gone straight to heaven? <laughs> We had a letter the other day. I couldn't believe it. It says, uh, a relative of mine died in an act of fornication. Did he go to heaven? <laughs> Do you hear what I said? Yeah? You didn't hear? You don't believe it, right? Do you think he went straight up? 
I run to the president, this guy, and an act of fornication died. Something happened to his heart, I suppose. <laughs> Must have been an old guy, too much for it. <laughs> What a question. Did he go to heaven? Well, true, you can't judge where he went. Chances are. <laughs> now, You say, well, well, does one sinful act send you to, he to hell? <laughs> well, the woman in the gospel was caught in adultery. But what did the Lord say to her? Go and sin no more. Sin is looked upon today as virtue. If a man doesn't have a mistress today, there's something wrong with him. You see, the enemy, he mixes it all up because there is no truth in him. None, whatever. As a result, he confuses you by deceit. And he makes you think right is wrong. and wrong is right. We have a call. Hello? Hi, Mother. Where are you from? I'm from Carlock, Illinois, and I'm eight years old. You're eight? Yeah. Wonderful. And, and, and what is your question? Uh, how do you know when a temptation becomes a sin? How do you know when a temptation becomes a sin? Yeah. That's your question? Yeah. When you give in to it. I don't know what you could give in to. I'm having a hard time with I'm glad you called, but I don't know. What can eight years old do? Um, say, for example, um, your mother asked you to do something, and uh, you looked at her, and you, you stamped your feet, and you said, no. Or... You went to your, uh, with your mother to the grocery store and uh, you, you stole two candy bars. Your mother didn't see you, the cashier didn't see you. And so you got home and you uh, ate the candy bars. The temptation was, I want a candy bar, but it didn't end there. The temptation was, take it. Your mind said, no, I shouldn't do that. My mother will be uh, very, very angry. And it's just a little thing, but I can stay. I can take it. Look how many candy bars in this store. They're not going to miss a couple candy bars. Sin. Now you people out there having a fit. But I said, an eight-year-old can come in and say, you're right, I didn't. And you can. Don't give me this stuff, eight-year-olds can't commit sin. If she could steal, then she could commit sin. So you see, honey, the, the difference is, now if you went through the grocery store, you said, oh, I want a candy bar. So mom, can I have a candy bar? No. Okay. You still want the candy bar, but you didn't give in. We call that virtue. It means what I wanted, I know I couldn't take unlawfully. Now, some of you parents make a big mistake here. I had a, a parent come to me one time. It was just kind of, it wasn't, she was here for some other reason. And she said, oh, the funniest thing happened the other day. She said, my kid stole a candy bar. I thought it was hysterical. I said, did he return it? Of course not. I said, you should go back and pay for it. I'm not going to say my kid uh, I saw a candy bar. 
but you just taught your kid how to steal and you approved. You thought it was funny. Next time he'll steal a car, see how funny that is. You see, mother's a disciplinarian. You're right. <laughs> you gotta be a disciplinarian. You just can't do what you want to do. Not even dogs do that. You must always know, what does Jesus want me to do? The temptation is not a sin. I want to repeat that. Temptation is not a sin. It's when you give in to it. That's why we have confession. That's why we all, from eight years old, seven years old, we need to go to confession. We need to get rid of this load we carry. Because the enemy, ah, now the enemy again, since we're talking about what he does, the first thing the enemy said, oh, that man, that priest knows who you are. He knows your voice. You're not going to go tell him what you just did last night? Are you crazy? Besides, everybody's doing it. Why are you so different? Oh, did you ever hear that? Up here? The enemy. Say, no, I'm not different. I want to be different. This is wrong. I must go to confession. When you're cut off from all the sacraments for one reasonable reason after another, remember, it is the enemy. Oh, it might look like it's got two legs and a nice face and maybe a brilliant mind. There is no mind as brilliant as Satan's. And when you fuss with him, it's like a, some little child arguing with Einstein. Forget it. Jesus only quoted scripture. That was all. Remember, don't give him the time of day. Don't talk about the enemy. Don't think of him, but know. Know your faith. Know your church, the real church. Not these little things popping up here and there. Know God. And you'll be safe. We have another call. Hello? Uh, yes, um, I had a qu First of all, when I tell people that Satan is alive and doing well, they look at me like I'm a nut. And uh, join they, the rest of us. <laughs> and they don't believe me. Um, my two questions were that um, when bad thoughts pop into your mind, and you don't intentionally think about them, but all of a sudden you're thinking about something you're not supposed to be thinking about. Um, did Satan put that in your mind? And oh, sometimes. Sometimes we do a good job ourselves, you know? <laughs> well, priest, I asked a priest if it was a sin. He said not if it was intentional, not if it was unintentional. Right. He's right. Um, also, when all is said and done and everybody's in either heaven or hell and the gates are closed, will hell and Satan be obliterated? Will they be gone? Will <laughs> God get rid of them? No, 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 no. That's eternal. The fire in hell is eternal, and, the, and the, the joy of heaven is eternal. Don't let any, that's another one of these little uh, untruths. Some say there is no devil. That's lie number one. Lie number two is that, look, if you go there, the Lord's going to forgive you at the end of the time. You see, the error in this is it is not the Lord who put you there. You put yourself there by unrepentance, by a refusal to believe that you have offended God. An evil person that goes to hell is it's impossible for them to live with God. It's not a matter of God forgiving. They don't want to be forgiven. They are so adamant in their evil. So hell is eternal. Now, when you get a thought and suddenly you're aware of the thought, don't worry how long it was before you were aware of it. 
as soon as you're aware of it, that's when you're culpable. What do you do then? Well, you say a prayer, you say an ejaculation, you say, oh, Jesus, help me. You know, I don't want these thoughts. That's virtue. That's how we become holy. We must always rely on truth. We have another call. Hello? Yes, hello, uh, Mother. I want to start off by saying that my mother and I love your show. And we Will you speak you. a little louder, please? Oh, yes. I want to start off by saying that my mother and I love your show and we love you. Thank you. Uh, I, I was wondering, Mother, if you can... Uh, we've been go my family has been going through a tragedy. We lost my brother. And I was wondering if you can point out something in the Bible that can give us some sort of comfort. Did I understand your brother? Yes. Uh, commit, kill someone? No, he was killed. He was killed. Okay. The best part of scripture to look at is our dear Lord himself. He also was killed. We must look at Jesus and know he was murdered, killed by the Pharisees, Sadducees, and all the rest of them out of jealousy, ambition, hatred. So what did he do? He looked down and said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. And you can be sure that Our Lady said the same thing. She was the most perfect disciple. And when she heard Jesus say that, I'm absolutely certain she said exactly the same thing. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. To me, that is the best place. Forgive your enemies. Do you have to feel nice? No, you can't sometimes. It takes a while. But you can forgive. And pray for those who do evil. And that is pleasing to God. Hard to get over some things like that. It's just very difficult. But don't worry about it being difficult. Just keep on forgiving, forgiving, forgiving. We have time for another call. Hello. Hello, sister. Uh, where are you from? I'm from uh, New Jersey. And what is your question? Um, I don't have a question. I just need for you to say a prayer for me and my, my, my daughter. Um, we work at the same place. and. She was caught last week stealing money, and um, she um, said it was for drugs for her and her boyfriend. Yeah. And I, you know, I work there, and they wouldn't let me go back to work until, like, say, three days later after it happened. And I just find it so difficult being I'm... there. That's a big part of your sanctification, the disappointment, the heartache, the concern you have for your daughter. Uh, but you see that the drugs, see right there is that, that drugs, everything that appeals to our senses. And there's great anguish, I know. Great anguish at work. So let's, let's just say a prayer for her, huh? For everybody tonight, that we understand that we live with the three great tempters, the, the struggles, the mortification that comes from overcoming ourselves, from, from living in a world that is as worldly as it's ever been before, more worldly than it's ever been before. And in a world that is so tempted and governed almost, you see, by evil. So let's say a prayer for your daughter, for everybody listening, for our television family, for everybody here. Lord God, we ask, Lord, that you allow us to use your redemption, your precious blood in the sacrament to help us fight, to help us overcome our, the, the, the difficulties and the, the, the concupiscence within our own souls and, and the world that we may 
we may know and recognize those things in the world that are not for our good and not like you, Lord. That we will recognize the subtle temptations of the enemy in the world who makes wrong seem right and right seem wrong. I ask, Lord, that you, you give us all that grace to see, to understand, and to overcome all these tempters, and that our spirit of mortification be ever ready to make any sacrifice, even unto death, rather than offend thee. We ask this in the name of Jesus and Mary. Amen. Well, I don't know what we're going to talk about next week, but I hope you have enjoyed the three programs on mortification. I hope you saw the Lord Jesus in his wondrous church, knowing of this time and knowing of you, thinking of you and loving you before time began. That God has all the sacraments here to make you holy. He left his word, his life, his example, his miracles. He left his church to tell you the pitfalls, the things that are wrong, the things that are evil, to point out through the Spirit of the Lord that you and I are called to great holiness. We must pray much, mortify ourselves, discipline ourselves, love much, and then through it all, we will one day be together in his kingdom. Well, I love you, and I'll see you tomorrow night. Bye now. To order this episode of Mother Angelica Live Classics from the EWTN Religious Catalog web store, log on to EWTNRC.com 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, or call 1-800-854-6316. Hello, family. Soon, we will be celebrating the resurrection of our Lord. At EWTN, our mission is to continually proclaim this glorious message to the nations. With live masses from around the globe, special live shows, and documentaries from the Holy Land, EWTN shares the joy of Easter with the world. Our foundress, Mother Angelica, passed into eternal life on Easter Sunday five years ago. It was Mother's passion to tell the world about the eternal word, Jesus Christ. Your donations directly help us to continue Mother's mission. With your gift today, you're helping a fallen away Catholic to learn the true teachings of the church. You're helping children learn about the saints and the sacraments. You're helping a widow to receive comfort and hope that only the Lord can provide. Most importantly, you're helping the world hear the message that Christ is risen. May God bless you through these final days of Lent and in the Easter season. EWTN is 100% viewer supported. Please make a gift today by going to EWTN.com forward slash Easter gift. You may also call us at 1-800-447-EWTN or send your donation to EWTN, 5817 Old Leeds Road, Irondale, Alabama, 35210. The ninth station, Jesus falls the third time. Consider the third fall of Jesus Christ. His weakness was extreme, and the cruelty of his executioners excessive, who tried to hasten his steps when he could scarcely move. Your attitude must be that of Christ. He emptied himself and took the form of a slave. Father, Look with pity on us, oppressed by the weight of our sins, and grant us your forgiveness. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.